This is 5 on 20 News, where the news is horrifying, but the newscasters are trying to stay calm. With Alex Kack and Ty Besh. Coming to you live from our studio in downtown Tucson. First, the local news. According to Tucson Police Chief Chris Magnus, his department is well overdue for some new vehicles. This comes after an incident a few weeks ago where a mobile command post vehicle started leaking diesel so badly the fire department had to be called in to clean up the mess. The chief is counting on the Tucson City Council to put up a half cent sales tax increase on the ballot for next May to alleviate some of his department's financial woes. 30 million of the estimated 50 million raised from the proposed tax increase would go toward equipment for the police and fire departments. Magnus estimates 63% of its patrol vehicles are in need of replacement. But his wish list doesn't end with cruisers. The department also is looking for new tasers, ballistic vests, and body cameras. Emphasis on body cameras. Forget about the alleged war on Christmas. Arizona Republicans are drawing a line in the sand in the new war on the American flag. Senator John Kavanaugh is hoping to make the theft of an American flag a felony offense. Under the current law, the theft of anything valued at less than $1,000 is a misdemeanor punishable by six months in the county jail and a $2,500 fine. SB 1009 would increase the penalty for American flag theft to a year in state prison and a $150,000 fine. That's regardless of which third world sweatshop the stolen flag was manufactured in. Kavanaugh's proposal would only deify the American flag. State flags, U of A flags, and any other flag or banner will still be up for grabs for a minimum punishment. With one vote, the Arizona legislature can destroy the game of capture the flag forever, which, let's admit it, was their true intention all along. <laughs> Jesus. Um, well, here's some good news for minimum wage workers in Arizona. Maricopa County Superior Court Judge Daniel Kiley has upheld the wage increase promised into Proposition 206. The Arizona Chamber of Commerce attempted to temporarily, temporarily halt the wage increase last week as a part of their lawsuit against Prop 206, which will raise the minimum wage to $10 an hour on January 1st and $12 an hour in 2020. Chamber President Glenn Hamer, channeling his inner Mr. Potter, calls the, in, the initiative sloppily written and says it's unfair to package paid time off with a wage raise. Luckily, there is a whole team of George Bailey's on the, on the other side looking out for the folks who do most of the working and paying and living and dying in this community. We tried to reach out to a minimum wage employee for the reaction, but they were running late to their second job. We left a message with one of their many roommates. A state commission is letting companies who violate safety laws get off easy. An investigation by the Arizona Daily Star found that the Industrial Commission of Arizona, appointed by Governor Doug Ducey, routinely grants businesses a lower fine amount when requested by that offending business. They found that out of the 139 proposals, fines were reduced by more than $186,000. This was from more than half the cases reviewed in 2016. The reductions hadn't been discovered because of a quirk in state law. According to Arizona's laws, penalties for hazardous working conditions can be legally reduced before the penalty is even imposed. The reduction can also be made after the penalty is imposed, but that would be more noticeable. The investigation was launched after OSHA issued a complaint against the commission on December 9th. The commission chairman says the group's goal is to prioritize workplace safety, not levy large fines against businesses. In 2015, the average fine for violating workplace safety laws in Arizona was $960. This is 40% lower than the national average of about $1,600. The fine for workplace injuries was just under $2,800, 70% lower than the national average. Critics say that this makes so it so there's no financial incentive for businesses to protect worker safety in the state. The commission rejects this notion, pointing out that businesses do promote safety citing that that one time a business owner created a jingle called, please avoid the sharp jutting metal thing. One of my favorites, actually. Um, the Salvation Army will receive 10,000 blankets that were almost delayed until January due to shortages. 
Last week, we reported that an increase in requests for blankets due to natural disasters left a shortage of blankets for the year. Renewing wasn't possible without an act of Congress. Representative Martha McSally ordered the blankets to be delivered by the Homeless Blanket Program. The blankets will arrive at the Salvation Army on December 27th, just in time for the arrival of winter here in Tucson. While we might not see eye to eye on a lot of issues, I do want to thank Representative Martha McSally for taking swift action with this one. And I wanted to take a moment to talk about the program you're watching right now. Here at 5 on 20, we're undertaking a new kind of citizen journalism. We're giving you the news as we see it, and we want more people to speak up with us. We need writers, hosts, anchors, camera people, sound people, the whole gamut. The times require a new way of informing ourselves, so join us. Do it, and do it now. Email us at info at creativetucson.org to get involved. And if you think that there's a story we're missing, a person we should interview, an upcoming event we should cover, or have any news tips for us, shoot us an email to info at creativetucson.org. We're here for you, and we want to cover all stories from all points of view. So don't be strangers. And now, in national and international news. The Russian ambassador to Turkey was shot dead at an opening of an art show today. Russian ambassador Andrei Karlov was a veteran diplomat, spending the majority of his career in Moscow. An Associated Press photographer captured this picture, while others ran for cover. The photo shows the assassin wearing the unofficial uniform of the secular Turkish state. He is said to be shouting in Arabic, quote, God is great. Those who privileged aligned to Muhammad for jihad, God is great. And in Turkish, quote, don't forget Aleppo. And also, quote, only death can take me from here. The assailant did die after 15 minutes of gun battle with the Turkish special forces. And in other international news of violence, a truck crashed into a Christmas market in Berlin today. Nine people were killed and many more were injured. According to police, a suspicious person has been arrested, and the White House has referred to the incident as a terrorist attack. Barack Obama already set the record for presidential pardons, but with a new wave of decisions, he has set the record for most acts of clemency in a single day. Obama's latest announcement includes the shortening of prison sentences for 153 convicts and the parting, pardoning of 78 others. Most of these prisoners were serving sentences for low-level drug crimes. In these final months of his presidency, Obama has granted clemency at a rapid-fire pace, and he is expected to issue more grants of commutations and pardons before he exits office next year, according to the White House counsel, Neil Eggleston, who announced the decisions in an official blog post today. With the latest wave of clemency, Obama brings the total number of sentences he has shortened to over 100, or I'm sorry, 1,100, and total pardons to 148. Eggleston describes all the individuals affected as deserving. In reply, the alt-right hemmed and hawed about soft on crime and described all Obamas as namby-pambies. And if you felt, felt an inexplicable shudder sometime today, don't be alarmed. It was probably just an extrasensory reaction to the 270th elector voting Trump for president. The Electoral College met at state capitol buildings across the country today to cast their vote for the next president and vice president of the United States. Each state gets a number of electorates equal to the number of representatives that state has in the House and Senate. Representatives of the presidential party that won each state's popular vote got to select their state's electorates. Trump secured 306 Republican electors on election night passing the magic number of 270 by 36 votes. And Republican electors did not give in to the countless petitions or their own desires to avert the coming apocalypse. Trump will get the nod on January 6th when the vote is counted. Since 1948, only nine electors have voted against their party's pick. So that shudder you felt, that mirror you heard shatter in the other room, that bird you saw fall dead from flight, well, now you know what that was about. Trump is basically, officially, our guy. Yay. But at least the president-elect will have a tough time keeping tabs on Muslims. Twitter is just the latest company to announce that they would not help the incoming administration build a Muslim registry. That includes companies like Facebook, Microsoft, 
IBM, Uber, Google, and Apple. The supporters of the proposed Muslim registration plan have cited Japanese internment during World War II as legal precedent. Opponents of the plan have cited Hitler with a spray tan as an interpretation of Donald Trump. Without the support of major online communication companies, Trump will have to rely on a network of old ladies peering out from behind window curtains to keep tabs on the estimated 3.3 million Muslims living in America. Top pen and paper manufacturers are expected to pull their support as well, leading to reports of Kellyanne Conway taking up stone engraving as a hobby. It has been revealed that Rex Tillerson, who was nominated to Secretary of State last week, has been a longtime director of a Russian U.S. oil firm based in the Bahamas. Tillerson became director of Exxon Neftegas, a subsidiary of Exxon Mobil, where Tillerson is now CEO. The revelations are from documents shared anonymously to the German newspaper Süddeutsche Zeitung. The subsidiary was set up partly to avoid taxes, a common business maneuver in the Bahamas, which has a zero corporate tax rate. While there's nothing illegal about Tillerson's past position, this comes at a time when tensions between the U.S. and Russia are at a high. Tillerson has been criticized for being too cozy with Russia, and the FBI and CIA have accused Russia of hacking emails to influence the election in Donald Trump's favor. Tillerson has denied a close relationship with Russia, despite having received a Russian Order of Friendship Award back in 2013. ExxonMobil has been known to be interested in developing Russia's oil and gas industry. They agreed to explore Russia's Kara Sea in 2011, but the project was put on hold after the Obama administration issued sanctions in 2014. Tillerson, who currently owns $218 million in Exxon stock, has a clear motive to get rid of sanctions against Russia. When asked about the potential conflicts of interest, Donald Trump responded that SNL is so very unfunny unfair and not fantastic. <laughs> Sounds like it was translated from Russian. A government agency in Michigan wrongfully accused 20,000 individuals of unemployment fraud, according to a state review. They found that an automated system accused unemployment claimants in 93% of cases. The Michigan Unemployment Insurance Agency combed through 22,427 cases where the system claimed insurance fraud. They found that most of the claims between 2013 and 2015 were false. In 2015, the state began having employees review the claims. Some of these accused of fraud were hit with fines up to $100,000, with others having their taxes garnished. The rest had to fight it out in long administrative hearings that are worse than being fined $100,000. In the report, the state said that just over 2,500 individuals had been paid back, totaling $5.4 million. This comes the same week that Michigan Republicans passed a bill that would use $10 million from the unemployment agency's contingency fund to pay down the budget. The contingent fund is made up of fines from unemployment fraud. So basically, the poor are being tasked to balance the budget while Michigan continues tax cuts for wealthy corporations. Next year, Michigan will institute the got a dollar rule, which requires unemployed citizens to let the state borrow a few bucks when they need it. The state promises to pay them back next Tuesday, they swear. Ever since John Henry died with his hammer in his hand, automation has been taking jobs from the working class. Now, Finland is taking a bold step towards a possible solution. Over the next two years, 2,000 unemployed Finnish citizens will receive a basic income from the government. It's part of an experiment for the government to see if more people in the country will start businesses. Finland is suffering from a period of massive layoffs among the tech industry. Currently, the unemployed are penalized if they earn extra income while laid off. So the government is taking these penalties away to see what the unemployed people will spend their money on. They're hoping that the easing of rules will allow citizens to seek out education, set themselves up for better careers, or even start a business. France, Canada, and the Netherlands will soon be enacting similar plans. The idea of a universal basic wage where every citizen, regardless of working status, receives a regular check to cover basic living expenses is gaining traction worldwide. Even here in the united, commie-hating states of America, a group is looking into it. Facebook co-founder Chris Hughes and economic experts launched the Economic Security Project earlier this month. 
Over the next two years, the group will be funding academic research and experimenting with unconditional cash stipends. Raising the minimum wage can only help alleviate financial insecurity as long as there is work to be done. And in a world where assembly lines are manned by machines and cars are on the verge of driving themselves, a universal basic income might be the only way to prevent the John Henrys of today from smashing the machines that are quickly rendering human labor obsolete. Mm. North Carolina Republicans have successfully voted to shrink the power of the state's governorship. The laws will cut the number of positions the governor can appoint and take away the governor's control of agencies that run education and information technology systems. The new laws were intended to curtail the power of Roy Cooper, the incoming Democratic governor. Cooper beat Republican Pat McCrory in November, causing the state's Republicans to call an emergency session. Critics claim that the move serves no purpose besides robbing the state's Democrats of decision-making power. The most extreme law would require Cooper to subject all cabinet appointments to Senate confirmation. This would slow down the process of government and prevent key positions from being filled quickly. The new laws come shortly after North Carolina Republicans were able to weaken the 1965 Voting Rights Act by requiring strict over voter ID laws. Critics say that the ID laws discriminate against the poor and people of color. Republicans charge that voting fraud is a serious problem, despite there being no evidence of widespread voter fraud from the 2016 election. The state's Republicans seek to further amend the voting system by requiring Democratic districts to vote in underwater hovels, only accessible by submarine. Rogue One might have had the second best December opening weekend ever. But the film's entrance into the world was not without a bit of Twitter hubbub. The alt-right attempted to create a Rogue One boycott with the hashtag Dump Star Wars. So what were the reasons for this sorry effort to get the public not to see the film of the season? Because it is so-called feminist propaganda. A group of conservatives were angry that the film carried messages against racism and sexism and took to Twitter to start a movement. These alt-right crusaders spread rumors that sections of the film were reshot to include anti-Trump messages, and they didn't give up the fight after the film broke box office records. Alt-right journalist Mike Cernovich tweeted yesterday that the film was not a huge hit, using how it stacked up against last year's Star Wars as evidence. So here are the facts. Rogue One took in $155 million and secured the second best December opening weekend of all time. It is the second only to Star Wars The Force Awakens, which had the very best December opening weekend ever, racking in an astounding $281 million. The Hobbit is the only movie that even got close to these two films in its rankings. The Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey, made $85 million back in 2012. Anyway, whichever way you frame it, you really can't compete with an epic space opera. Try picking on a holiday ensemble film next time. Why not hashtag dump office Christmas party? This was Alex Kack. And Ty Besh. For 5 on 20 News. Next up, Sean Sees Dead People.
calmly to watch the failing breath, wishing each sigh might be the last, longing to see the shade of death over those beloved features cast. Charlotte Bronte said that. As we begin to put this year away, I will talk about who died today. Actually, that's not true, so let me tweak. A couple of folks died this past week. One died very young, but authored a book. One could read a whole page in one single look. One read a studio, he was a Western producer and a Hungarian-American audience seducer. Let's go. On this day in 1848, English novelist and poet Emily Bronte died at the age of 30 of tuberculosis. She was the younger sister of Charlotte Bronte from our opening quote today, also a writer. She wrote many poems, but famously published uh, only one book, Wuthering Heights, now considered an English classic. It was first published in 1847, originally under the pseudonym of Alice Bell. It tells the story of a young man on retreat who gets snowed in at his landlord's strange country home. He is forced to stay the night and is visited by a ghost named Catherine in his sleep. English singer-songwriter Kate Bush adapts the story from Catherine, the ghost's point of view, in her 1978 single, Wuthering Heights. What in tarnation is Wuthering? Well, it means blustery and turbulent and often describes the fierce, noisy winds that blow across the moors, which is where the story is set. I sometimes forget what the symptoms are of these older diseases that we don't encounter very much in the modern world. Tuberculosis is an infectious bacterial disease characterized by the growth of nodules or tubercules, tubercles, primarily in lung tissue. Victims of the disease often cough blood. Uh, while this is what eventually killed Bronte, her health was most likely weakened by the harsh local climate and by unsanitary conditions at home in Northern England, where water was contaminated by runoff from the church's graveyard. While at her older brother Branwell's funeral, Emily caught a severe cold, which quickly developed into inflammation of the lungs and led to the tuberculosis. Bronte was said to be a mysterious figure with a touch of the macabre. In one quote, we understand that she might have been vocal about gender equality. Um, in this quote, I also feel is uh, both inspiring and macabre. What our souls are made of, his and mine are the same. Both men and women have souls, I guess. Duh. On this day in 2009, American savant Lawrence Kim Peake died of a heart attack at the age of 58. Peake, who went by Kim, was often called a mega savant for his exceptional memory. The 1988 movie Rain Man, starring Tom Cruise and Dustin Hoffman as the fictional savant Raymond Babbitt, is inspired by Kim Peake's life. Peake's special abilities started early, uh, around the age of a year and a half. He could read both pages of an open book at once, one page with one eye and the other with his other eye. <laughs> this style of reading continued until his death. His reading comprehension was impressive. He would retain 98% of the information he read. Since he spent most of his days in the library with his dad, he quickly made it through thousands of books, encyclopedia, and maps. Though he was strongly introverted, he did not have difficulties with social understandings and communication. Therefore, he was not autistic. Instead, his special abilities came from the lack of connections between the right and left hemispheres of his brain. This rare condition is often called uh, split brain syndrome. Another anomaly that people with split brain syndrome usually have is split personality disorder. Peak did not. And as you may have heard uh, yesterday, Hungarian-American actress and socialite Zsa, Zsa Gabor died at the at, of a heart attack at the age of 99. Gabor and her Two also famous sisters, Eva and Magda, were all born in Budapest, but later immigrated to the United States to begin working in film and television. Zsa was famously married nine times, having divorced seven, uh, and, and that was uh, throughout her life. And uh, this led to her great wisdom of marriage and men. You never really know a man until you've divorced him. And I'm a marvelous housekeeper. Every time I leave a man, I keep his house are examples of these wise words. She also called everyone darling, like that with like an H. Her reason is I call everyone darling because I can't remember their names. In her lifestyle video series, 
It's simple, darling. <laughs> Gabor teaches us that maintaining a thoughtful and healthy lifestyle is simple if you have bodybuilders as manservants to stretch your body for you as you flirt with them. Here's a taste. That's, but it's all broken. Um, so, author Gerald Frank, who helped Gabor write her autobiography, says that Zsa, Zsa is unique. She's a woman from the court of Louis XV who has somehow managed to live in the 20th century undamaged. She says she wants to be all the pompadours and deberries of history rolled into one, but she also says, I always goof. I pay my own bills. I want to choose the man. I do not permit men to choose me. So um, this news just came to me today. Fashion editor and early supermodel China Machado died yesterday after suffering from cardiac arrest. Born Noel de Souza Machado, she got her first big break after being photographed by legendary fashion photographer Richard Avedon. The Chinese Portuguese American was the first non white individual to be on the cover of a major American magazine. This was the February issue of Harper's Bazaar in 1959. After joining the Cabinet, a group of models for the fashion house of Givenchy, Machado changed her name to China. As a runway model, she also worked for Christian Dior and Balenciaga. It was something of a controversy to publish the 1959 cover for fear that the South, Southern United States, would abandon the magazine and they would lose advertisers. China did not discover until many years later that Dick, Richard Avedon, had treated, uh, I'm sorry, threatened to quit working for the magazine if they did not publish the cover. And on Friday, Tucson resident, or uh, Fry, uh, Robert Shelton, Founder of Old Tucson Studios and longtime advocate for the Southern Arizona movie industry, died of natural causes at the age of 95. Old Tucson said uh, that the Wild West themed park has draped several areas in black and white um, bunting to honor Shelton, including a museum named in his honor. Bob Shelton was a charismatic visionary who turned Tucson into the Hollywood of the desert said old uh, Tucson general manager Terry uh, Verhage. He was boastful, but uh, he wasn't boastful, but he did boast about uh, how once he had John Wayne, Clint Eastwood, Lee Marvin, and Burt Lancaster all working on films at the same time. Um, Shelton uh, founded Old Tucson, the company, in 1959, 20 years after Columbia Pictures built the town as a set for Arizona an epic Western film starring Gene Arthur and William Holden. Shelton was involved in the production of more than 300 movies and television shows between 1959 and 1985, which is when he sold Old Tucson. And that's all the death I've got for today, folks. Join me next week for the year in review as we pay homage to the more significant deaths of the year and bury it. Here's Kay Bush's Wuthering Heights music video.